for it. All right, Tim. <laughs> Do you remember that commercial? Joe's back with Memorex. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm right there with you, Joel. I've, I've been, I, I need to move some floppy disks out of the way so I can put the notebook in front of me. <clears throat> hey, good to see you guys. Oh, you're back. You're back. So, okay, vacationing once again. Talk about your vacation, first of all, because you just live the dream and I live vicariously through you. So, please, because I never leave the trade cave. So please tell me about your vacay. <laughs> well, it, it, and what we're doing is we're just trying to do everything we can while we can. Really, it's 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 not That's more complicated than that. You know, life is short, and uh, we're trying to go every place that we can while we can move. And uh, I can tell you, Greece is a place you should go. Uh, it, it exceeded our expectations. We we spent very quickly. We spent three weeks there. Um, so we went to uh, Santorini and Mykonos, you know, fancy places, desert islands, very expensive. Uh, then we went to uh, Athens and, and we drove in a in sort of a big circle, drove a thousand kilometers, jumped on a, on a catamaran off the coast, uh, the Ionian coast. Uh, the island over there is called Lefkada, sailed around the islands, came back, went, visited Corinth. That was fascinating. Went back to Athens. Wow. So. Uh, we, you know, I even managed to learn a dozen words of Greek during that time. So, so uh, you think, well, couldn't you have learned more? Well, I've got only a handful of brain cells, you know, and, <laughs> and, and the few I've got are generally concerned with market structure. But I can tell you, Greece is just a great place. The rest of the country, very diverse geographically. You know, you tend to think of Greece as a dry place. There are parts of it that are very lush, uh, the beautiful villages fabulous ancient architecture everywhere you go there's some ancient thing in front of you it's just really incredible people are awesome food is fantastic i gained 10 pounds you can probably no. tell no i'm serious i was in oh it's I, was the face. In, I was in fighting shape when we went and uh well, you start <laughs> eating and drinking your way around greece and uh, it Ugh. fades fast but anyway it's good to be back good to see you guys uh, that's what Make I love any to hear. trades while you're on and cruising around and doing everything. Did you do any trading or do you just like separate yourself? No, like, no. no, I'm getting away from the markets for a couple of weeks. I, I do not. I, okay. I went to cash and Tim I Tim is out. married. Yeah. That's all I got to yes. say. Tim is married. I, <laughs> and they don't like I that one. <laughs> trading on your vacation. I understand my priorities and I'm very grateful for them. By the way, the love name it, of our boat, it. purely by chance, the name of our boat was Gratitude. So we, we thought, well, that's perfect because we're very grateful for the things we get to hey. do. Hey, well, we're grateful to have you on here, Tim. And, and so one thing that I want to say is that did you think about changing market structure AI? Because we need to add that last little bit to there or something because – if we get it going here, who knows where market structure can go? Um, of course, we saw the markets on Friday really take off. It seemed like an everything rally. What did you see? And of course, even better, what did market structure edge see? Well, great question, Mitch. So if you look at it purely from a data standpoint, as to the AI, I mean, I would say there's evidence globally that AI already is at work in the trading environment. In fact, uh, we've talked about this before. I think that AI, the use of the use of data, large language sets, machines, algorithms to make decisions, is something that's been present in the U.S. market for a very long time. It's spread globally, um, and and I'll pick that theme up right after I say that to me, what has happened June one and two, June two, uh, you know, you can say, well, it's this great jobs data. Well. I, we can talk about that jobs data. Uh, to me, this was much more about a global macro move, and it's there in the data. If you look at the data, if we were to parse the, the demographics of the money May 31, when index futures expired, and compare it to what happened June 1 and 2, both. So we're new month, new money. What are the, how did the behaviors change? In those two days, there was a 24% increase in the S&P 500 in flows from passive investment. There was a 0% change in active investment. So you cannot 
if you take the data at faith, if you, number one, if you accept, okay, do we have a reasonable way to measure that? Well, we've been doing it a long time and very accurately. So I would say it was not a rational response. It was, a, it was an asset allocation decision to put more money to work in equities. And look, we're not alone. The Japanese market, where the debt to GDP ratio is 226%, is trading at a three decade high. The DAX, the German market, where the economy is in recession, two quarters of contracting GDP is trading the, about as high, it's up as much as our market is in 2023. Look at the Asian markets. It's everywhere. You can't just say, oh, it's this great jobs number in the United States. Were that true, there would be a separation between the United States and all these other markets, which brings us back to AI, Mitch. I think that trend following, global macro funds, quantitative funds, asset allocation models make fairly quick changes by consuming data with machines and responding to them. This is the problem to me with prices and technical factors. You know, you guys are really good with technicals and I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying that you have to think about this in terms of what the money is doing. If the machine setting prices and thus altering the technical signals make decisions in two days, how quickly can things change? Well, I would remind people that in June last year, the S&P 500 was down 8%. It was up 8% in October last year, but it all came in the last week and a half. Remember, we hit lows in the market in yeah. October. It's, it's very important to remember that a day or two is not a trend. You can't now all of a sudden say, well, everything's perfect. Let's plow money back. The banks are fine. Everything's awesome. That is not the way that the market works. Would that it work? I wish that you could depend on the market as a barometer of the underlying economic factors. And I'll, I'll add this one little thing. I know I've gone on here for a bit. But when you look at the data, the jobs data, there are two components to that data. I know that data very well. I've been tracking that data for 15 years. So the establishment survey showed a $339,000 job increase. That is a survey of businesses. However, it gets adjusted. They change the benchmark every year. In 2021, they lifted the benchmark, the baseline by 506,000 jobs. One of the largest increases since that data was accumulated and that we started in 1948. If you look at the household data, it declined 310,000 and unemployment increased by 442,000, right? So if you actually net the data out, it's not very good. If you look at the income data, GDI as opposed to GDP, we are in recession. Hours mm -hmm. are falling. The economic data is not great, people. Get that through your heads. And so yeah. that's important and don't let it influence how you trade the market. You trade supply demand divergences. You stack the probabilities in your favor. You're very careful around things that can change outcomes. We told people watch May 31, could be a challenging day. Index futures reset. Jobs data, very tradable event. Event. You just have to be aware of those things. So where's the money going, Tim? I mean, we saw the IWM pick up. I mean, did you get any signals from uh, Market Structure Edge and where is it going? Is it going to keep on going? And the other thing I just want to add is, uh, you know, we have uh, we have a uh, quad witch coming up a week from Friday, right? We got the you talked about the June price action, uh, but first things first, Tim, where is the money going, and is it going to keep going there? Well, it's very smart to point that out, Joel. Those and it's not just a quad witch; it's index rebalances, and and we're you know we're talking about potentially today pulling out of a technical bear market recovering 20% from the October lows, basically. So uh, how important will that be to people who are exposed to equities, the indexes that have to track a benchmark and, and where the gains have been heavily concentrated? Friday, is, or Friday was the first big exception to that. And yet still 70% of the S&P 500, and again, I'm not a technical trader, are trading below their their 50-day moving average, right? So it, it, it's not a broad-based move. Up until Friday, 
Seven stocks were responsible for all the moves in the S&P 500. That's you could look crazy, across, too. isn't it? You could look across every sector and the top 10 stocks were almost wholly responsible for the performance of those sectors. Well, I mean, that's very challenging, right? You got to keep that in mind. Is the, is the money really broad-based or does it go to certain places? So the answer to my, in my view, Joel, here's how I would look at this. And, you know, there are multiple ways to look at it, but I'm always going to look at, first of all, what is the supply demand balance in the S&P 500? I always want to know that. And that's what we call broad market sentiment. And we'll look at here's price. This is SPY. There's the big move on Friday. So two move, two day move that really spark, you know, spike the market. But it's done it before. You know, if you go back and look at all the days that the market has moved. Big move, big move, big move, big move, big move, big move. So it happens, but here's the demand side. Demand probably recovers, but it's at 4.8. You need a minimum 5.1 to sustain gains. So how is it that the market has risen? Well, it rose principally because of a deficit in supply, which is short volume. But still, these levels are over 50%. So if you look at the supply and demand balance and just take it at face value, I mean, either the data are wrong or they're correct. But if these data are correct, we have the same condition still. Now, if it changes, we'll change our tune. If this slides back below 50% and demand rises back over five, different matter. But if that doesn't happen, then nothing has changed. So that's the number first thing I look at. Second thing is let's go look at the dashboard and see where the money's going. I like to look across the sectors. In fact, let's start with big tech. Here's big tech. So it's a 30 day view of demand. It's pretty darn good yet. Do we still and got legs? We still got legs there? I would say yes. I mean, it's come off its high, but it's it's flattened out at 7.9. That's still really good. And Dennis, I know you you would say, Sell the other stuff, buy tech on any weakness. The, the, and, and there's some merit to that because yeah. there remains very strong demand in tech and insufficient supply. It did tick up on Friday, did tick up on Friday. Uh, so then let's go look at, you know, where is the money going otherwise? Well, you would say a great indication of the strength of the consumer would be to look at consumer discretionary, which has performed very well. But it's because, again, a small handful of stocks in consumer discretionary are actually tech stocks. And so it's done well. But look at consumer discretionary. Is this a market you would buy? Well, the supply side's falling, but it's above 50%. Demand has fallen back below five. No, I wouldn't buy that. Doesn't mean the stocks can't move. But I don't look at that and say, well, that's a great signal for the consumer. How about consumer staples? Demand below five. Supply after a huge bubble there came down on Friday, but it's still 50%. I'm not plowing money into those sectors. So I can look across here and say, I don't see broad based momentum in the market. And in fact, my momentum portfolio will tell me my momentum portfolio has 10 components. It had 20 or close to that a week ago. Uh, so it's gone down, not up. Low volatility, call that value. Nine components, financials leads, fast trading is the price setter, supplies down. I mean, I think there could be, and Dennis, you may disagree, a move to value afoot. It's not a very broad one because there are only nine components. You look at the momentum side, it's good. It's good, uh, but there are only 10 in it. it so I think, Joel, like this is a long-winded answer. Maybe this doesn't hold. Maybe it doesn't hold. Triple D, I know you wanted to add something in there. It's what we saw on Friday. I mean, we finally started to see, and I think you're starting to see it in your numbers a little bit here too. I mean, one day we say it doesn't make a difference, but maybe it can make a difference in this case. I mean, the value is still, the, the separation here, the gap between, you know, tech and growth and value. Yep is probably as wide as, and I don't have the stats, but you can just feel how wide it is. It's widened tremendously in 2023. Yep. Is there a check back? Is there, you know, where value actually starts to outperform growth, even just for a short period of time? I feel like it, it's bound to do that here eventually. Now, again, is, you know, the dip going to get bought and tech in the rally sold in value and we continue on our merry way? I don't know. But I tell you, Friday was a step in the right direction for the value guys. No question. If I look at, if I pick the best two, what I would consider the best two 
uh, stocks, if I look at, at momentum versus low volatility, I'm going to go into this portfolio because it reinforces your point. So to me, Micron is the best of the momentum lot. And all I'm looking at is it's a 10. It's top, but that just means it's got slamming good demand yet. 41% supply, that's well below the 50% in the S&P 500. And the 30-day trend in supply is down. The lead behavior is derivatives. That means people are levering into it. Now, again, that doesn't mean, you know, it's not what happens today. It's what, can that thing give you some gains yet? Well, I look at it and say, yes, here's demand and here's supply. But, okay, that's the good news. If I look at J&J, even, even CVX, J&J, which is a value or low volatility trade, has a much better supply demand divergence. Demand hardly ever moves off of five in J&J because it's a value stock. But look at that supply drop. That's the kind of thing that could power a move in J&J. And it suggests one day is not a trend. I would need to see some moves for a period of time. I like a five-day rolling average of moves because that's how many moves in the market. But if that holds, right, Tim, Tim, we're, we're, we're kind of we're running up against the clock here, but we okay. are glad to have you back. Tim Quas, market structure ag, back from Greece, a little bit Joel, heavier. Joel's off. cutting me off. Joel's cutting yeah, me off. Yeah, he's never done that. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is, baby. If you want the information, I'll tell you where you can get it. Well, you can just go to Market Structure Edge, threw up the link there. You guys can check it out yourself, right? Well, there you guys have it. Have a great one. Tim Quas, always good you to have you back too. on. Have a great week. Tim, See thanks ya. for coming back. We're, we'd love to have you back.